Good morning. Good morning. Last Sunday, we began a series on the implications of the resurrection. And Nathan White, our assistant pastor, did an outstanding job opening up this series. That brother has forgotten more than I'll ever know. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. Um, so, in light of that, I'll just put the, I'll shift the burden. I'm going to put the burden on the sons of Korah. Psalm 84, when mother's sons come home to sing. Would you stand now as we give our attention to the reading of God's holy word, Psalm 84. To the choir master, according to the Giddith, the, a psalm of the sons of Korah. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My flesh and my heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrows find a home and the swallows a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise, Selah. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools, and they go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold our shield, our God. Look on the face of your anointed, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Your word, O Lord, is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Let's pray. Our Father, we submit ourselves to the truth and implications of your word this morning. Be pleased by your Holy Spirit to give a gift of tongue to this imperfect preacher and a gift of ear to these your imperfect people that we might hear from Jesus and him only. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. And we've never forgotten the lesson of the Wizard of Oz. But long before there was Dorothy clicking her heels, there was the janitors of God singing their song. There's no place like home, but at an altogether different place. They were the sons of Korah, you recall, from the families of Levitical priests. First Chronicles 20, uh, 26 tells us that these mother's sons had been designated doorkeepers in the temple, almost like janitors, and they loved it. There's a look in their eyes and a crook in their smile, as if they know something we don't. What? Men made new when mother's sons come home to sing. You see, they're supposed to be dead. The narrative in number 16 explains, there the clan of Korah rose up in rebellion against Moses and the hand of God came down against them. Separate yourselves from them that I may consume them. 
declared the Lord. And the ground beneath them split apart. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up all who belonged to Korah. You understand? A whole generation, the entire generation, wiped out a dark legacy only whispered about. And yet, look now, look here. They're leading in worship. Men made new. And their first response is always what? Worship. Whole soul, mind, emotions, and will engaged, involved, participating, this sense of responsiveness in worship. Men made new find themselves breathing a new kind of air. There's a spring in their step and a song in their heart. The weight of glory is not in Kansas, but in a new place to dwell and a new perspective to draw and a new power to depend. And that you might not ever forget it, these sons put it to meter and music. Psalm 84, three movements in this psalm, almost like a, a movie score carrying us along. Each, each movement with its images of irony and contrast punctuated by the Hebrew Selah, which is a metrical cue instructing us to pause to take a breath because you're going to need it. Three lyrical movements. One big idea for men made new. It's about proximity to God over prosperity of the world. That's the secret of their smile and their song. And so in this first movement we see in verses 1 through 4, we, we see this. They sing of a new place to dwell. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts, they sing in verse 1. Imagine for a moment uh, these servants of the Lord nearing their time of service in worship, moving up the steps of the temple, approaching the door of the temple, possibly uh, reflecting on all the day's events and the demands that are pressing upon their lives, uh, not unlike, by the way, um, the way you and I often arrive uh, here every Sunday, except for the birds, the birds, sparrows and swallows. Did you see that in verse 3? Even the sparrows find a home and the swallows a nest. Sparrows, you, you've seen them, you're familiar with them. They're symbols here of worthlessness. It is said about the children of Jerusalem that they would catch sparrows just for fun or maybe to sell them on the street for a little spending money. There was a saying, uh, two for a farthing. A farthing, you know, of course, being the least valuable coin. In other words, two for a penny. And swallows, symbols of restlessness. Birds known as flittering, flitterers, they flitter everywhere from dawn to dusk, migrating, very, very transient. And seeing the birds, the hearts of men made new, they explode here. How lovely! Maybe better translated, awesome! I love God's place. There's just something about this place you see in verse 2. My heart longs for God's place. Now, let's be honest. You read verses 1 through 4 there and uh, such uh, poetry and passions, well, just seem almost irrelevant to us. And uh, goosebumps may not describe... Um, your experience driving into the parking lot this morning. 
I understand that. But what if I told you that the description here, the poetry and the page, uh, passions of verses 1 through 4 are not about the building, but about the broadness of God's mercy. Ah, now we're getting a little closer. Lucky birds. Now, kids, let me just pause and say, if you're doodling with crayons right now, on your, uh, on your bulletin or a piece of paper, or if you've got the sermon notes, take your crayon and draw. Uh, draw some birds. You'll never forget this point. You see, just as the birds seem so welcome and free, safe from any threat or fear, so the people of God likewise experience this, free to make their home in God. It resonates deep within. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. Not merely flittering around the eaves, but at the very center, at your altars. You see that in verse 3? At your altars, O Lord, my King and my God. At your altars, the blood of bulls and goats was shed and sprinkled, and yet unable to resolve the threat and fears of the ultimate enemy, sin and misery and death, except for that these sons saw at a distance and in the shadows the promise of the greater altar to come, the altar of Christ himself, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. At your altars, these Korah men would rehearse and respond to his saving work and experience both, both uh, worth and rest. What nests are to swallows, God is to man, writes Graham Scroggy, and we would find God at the altar. So where you stay, you've heard that before. It's a slang expression. In some circles, it means more than your address. It's about a place called home, uh, an orientation of your life and your loves. Where, where do you really live? These sons made new live at his altar where God is always for you. Selah. Take a breath. Pause to reflect. It's not about seeing a bigger you or me, but a bigger cross. It's no secret that Jesus in the New Testament interprets the temple, its place, and all of its furniture, and all of its function as pointing to and being fulfilled in Christ himself. There in the temple, he was identified as light and glory. And there, truth and authority appears. In the temple, the sick were healed and the sinner justified. In the temple, the children cried out, Hosanna. In the temple, the veil was torn from top to bottom. Of the temple is the promise made. I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And at the temple, Jesus said, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. And friends, the empty tomb remains. Do you understand now the implications of the resurrection? The living, resurrected Christ is the true temple, certifying all what the sons of Korah sing about in the shadows. Korah men would say, they would say to us on this side of the cross and this side of the resurrection, make your way there. Stay there in the bigness and broadness of God's mercy. 
Be captivated by the lyrics. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Blessed are the captivated. Those who long to dwell there. To worship the living God. The loving God. Loving us at the altar. In verses 5 through 8, we read, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools, and they go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Here now, in the second movement of the song, there's movement, literally. And one imagining, imagines, again, the, the shuffling of the Koromen feet, the, the turning, if you will, at the door. Maybe a momentary flashback at the travels along the way to the temple. They've come from scattered towns and villages these janitors of God know well the highways and the valleys and, the, and all the stories and all the, the strange journey to God. Stories such as uh, Jacob's run. You remember trick, tricks and two weddings, a limp along the way, the fear of a family reunion and the trauma to his youngest boy. Or how about David's chronicles? His chronicles of mighty men and mighty mistakes. Or Rick's own version of America's most embarrassing moments on his way to finding grace. You see, life is a walk. It's a run. It's a race. It's a highway. And it's always full of unexpected twists and turns. It seems... It seems as if everyone has to pass this way through, not around, the valley of Baca, the valley of tears, that stretch along the highway that stretches you, the unpleasant, the inconvenient, a dangerous leg on the journey to God. Been there, done that. And children, if you're still coloring, let me tell you, here's a great place to stop and, and draw a map. Draw some roads going through the mountains and into the valleys. You'll never forget this. Why must it be through the valley and not around? Why, Lord? Think about it. It's because at the stretch, at the turn, that's where the highways of the heart are cut. And it's, there, and it's there, right there, that something amazing happens. Blessed are those who strengthen as you, whose heart are the highways of Zion. Um, you know, for many years, in fact, just recently, um, Kent Quinn and I were talking about this. For many years, I've helped um, manage a, a, a family track of timberland in South Georgia. And uh, it wasn't too long ago that it was time to cut. Uh, we needed to uh, cut an 80-acre track uh, to harvest the timber, the mature timber. And this 80-acre track was my favorite, my favorite section. Uh, the, the prettiest acreage with the, with the most stately pine trees. But the logging roads needed to be carved out for the heavy equipment uh, to get in there. And I watched in horror uh, as the ugly debris mounded up, made by these huge machines on their way to the choices of my trees. I know it would have brought my mother-in-law to tears. And all I had to draw upon were the promises of the forester who kept reminding me, Rick, in the end, the scarring of the land 
would be transformed into a more beautiful and more valuable piece of property. Well, theologian Graham Scroggy clarifies that illustration, saying this, the journey brings its trials, but God would turn his tears into a fountain and so would make his sorrows a source of strength. Now, you and I, we would shake our fists and sinfully slow, right? Convinced that Baca was there to beat you, but instead is there to bless you. The valley of tears now becomes pools of strength. There's not a more dramatic promise in contrast to a more dangerous place. But listen, you and I, we, we won't know this. We won't draw a new perspective about the unexpected crook in the journey, about the fear and the hurt and the disappointments until you go where Korah men go. King David described it this way. When, I, when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you until, until I came in to the sanctuary. For men made new, something happens in the context of worship. We discover windows of light we're given eyes to see, to draw out a new perspective, to map out the mysterious sovereign ways of the Lord. In the liturgy of worship, in the rehearsing of the redemptive story of God, especially the resurrection of Jesus Christ from a mound of trash called Calvary, there in all that, and by the way, there's no place you can go that he had not already been and come out the other side victorious. In all that, there is the gift of faith given in order that we might redraw the map. Daring to dig blessings out of hardship where the highways of the heart are cut and Baca turns into blessing. And there's more where that came from. You see that in verse 8? Oh, Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give, give ear. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 7. They go from strength to strength. They go from strength to strength. Pushing ahead, they pray, Oh, Lord, hear my prayers, Selah. Hear my worship, O oh living God. Oh, loving God, loving us at the valley. Blessed is the one who sees a new perspective to draw. And not for the building or even for the blessings of Baca. But blessed is the one who adds it all up. Nothing compares. And he simply receives. He receives a new power to depend in this last movement, verses 9 through 12, there's an expression that is uh, re repeated. It's, it's an expression of a certain look. It's all about the look of men made new. You know what I'm talking about? You know that look, don't you? I mean, I see it every day in, Ava, in my dog Ava's face. <laughs> she looks this way, she looks that way, she looks across the street, she looks across town, and right? Um, and we do it every day. Uh, there's always a choice to be made. This rather than that. It, this is what they sing. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather, I choose to be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. 
So there's always a choice, this rather than that. It's about where is one to find ultimate satisfaction, justification for their existence? Would it be in the tent of the world or in the temple of God? To rephrase the question, is God big enough? Is he big enough to you? Is he big enough? Is he good enough? Is he powerful enough to provide all that you need? If ever there was a temptation to look horizontally at the shields of men, even to King David, as he's maybe alluded to here as the anointed of verse 9, these janitors of God would choose and say, Behold, look, not at him, but at him. Why? Because the Lord, verse 11, the Lord, Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, is a sun and shield, light and power, Guide and guard. But more probably a, a poetic merism here. A figure of speech magnifying the infinite extremes. What is it you need? The sun taking us vertical. The shield taking us horizontal. As if to say, anything above, anything below... The Lord is infinite in his power and resources. The whole treasury of heaven is at the disposal of men made new. And maybe the same here with the words favor and honor. This poetic merism, grace and glory, satisfaction and significance. Like no one else, nothing else, the Lord God. Now in the face of the risen Jesus Christ, to whom all authority in heaven and earth has been given, who stands in ascended glory, ever making intercession for the saints, and who now has poured out richly his spirit upon men made new in ways that the sons of Korah had only a foretaste. He gives he gives at the right time. He gives any time and all the time. Whatsoever you need from heaven and from earth. And here's a good place, kids, if you're still colored. Color some stick people looking up. And maybe a picture of a dove coming down. So generous. So generous, so able. The sons of Korah say no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Who in the context of worship, look. Not this way and not that way, but look up to a new power. To receive, to trust, to depend. Do the math. Add it up. These sons of Korah did. Did you see that in verse 10? One day versus a thousand. It's a no-brainer to the sons of Korah. Their first choice, a continual choice to stand and serve, if only at the door, even in smallness, over anything else offered. For there, there in the temple, there at the altar, there where the perspective and the map is redrawn. There is the blessedness of the one who trusts, who depends upon a new power from the Lord of hosts, of heavenly powers come down, fall afresh on me, O living God, O loving God, loving us at the choice where proximity triumphs prosperity. Listen, as we wrap up here, we all know 
the sense of unfulfilled longings and the journey through the valley of tears and the temptation at the tents of the wicked. We share that in common. But the gift of the singers to us is the Selah. The overwhelming reason to pause, to gasp. Envious of the birds, these sons don't despair. A dangerous journey, they don't care. Choices to make, it doesn't compare. Psalm 84 is about men made new. When mother's sons come home to sing, they lead us, they sing to us, they sing us into their secret smile. And all of what these uh, sons experienced in the temple only foreshadowed the implications of the resurrection. You see, the empty tomb certifies and offers a new place, a new perspective, and a new power, blessedness to men made new. Selah. So maybe one takeaway for us this morning is to pause. Maybe we even need to stop and even gasp as we ask ourselves, where do I long to dwell? What have I learned to redraw? Whom will I look to to depend? Men made new are marked by these three. Do you believe that men and women and boys and girls can be made new? Have you been made new? Jesus came and suffered and died, was buried and rose again to make men new. Born again, he says in John chapter 3. You see, it's not about church membership or whether you've been dunked or sprinkled or dry cleaned. It's not praying a prayer or ringing the bell. But where the Spirit of God convicts you and convinces you and by His grace gives you faith alone in Christ alone, the first expression of one made new. This is the hope of the gospel. That when we were dead in sin, God made us alive together with Christ. Ephesians chapter 2. Born again to the living hope by the resurrection of the dead, Peter says in 1 Peter 1, and given a new heart and a new spirit is the way Ezekiel describes it. Have you been made new? Well, maybe another takeaway. There are plenty here. I trust the Holy Spirit has given you all kind of tracks to run down. But maybe another takeaway for us And maybe this is for all the mothers who have ever ached, who have wept, who have begged the Lord on behalf of their children. Now, that's not to exclude fathers or any of us who ache and beg on behalf of another. This is for you too. For those who have ached on behalf of the Lord for others. Keep believing. Keep believing. Believe in the God of divine reversals that is reflected here in Psalm 84. This is the implications of the resurrection sketched out and painted for us. And it means that he is able to bring them home all the way. Even singing. Bring my sons and daughters from afar, God says to Isaiah, to the east and to the west and from the north and from the south. I will say, give them up, all whom I have called by my name. The prophets envisioned that day, and it has come through the pain of another mother. 
whose son by his altar would become the dwelling of God and by his trail of tears, the pool of perspective and by his resurrection, the power carrying every good thing to men made new. This is blessedness. When mother's sons come home to sing. Thank you, mom. Thank you for bearing all your sons and all your children, for carrying their burdens and ferrying them to places unknown and tarrying until they all come home. Let's pray. Father, we are humbled when we consider the tall shoulders upon which we stand this morning, even these sons of Korah, they are not tall because of their height, but because they are standing upon the altar of the living God, the loving God made known through Jesus Christ. May their song become the melody of our lives and the hope of the world. We praise you that the intimations and the experiences in a place shadowed in time and distance has begun anew in fuller dimensions because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. His life intersects and interrupts our longings, inviting us to a new place to dwell and a new perspective to discover and a new power upon which to depend. Make it so, Lord, make it so. For Jesus' sake and for the sake of all our sons and daughters who come behind us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.